Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik wa rahm ala abdika wa rasulik Sayyidina Muhammad al-Nabi al-Ummi wa ala alihi wa sallim taslima. Subhanallahi wa bihamdi, subhanallah al-Azim, subhanallahi wa alhamdulillahi wa la ilaha illa Allahu wa Allahu akbar. Uh, today is the introductory session for this series we will be doing in the month of Ramadan. Today I am inshallah live broadcasting this session. There will be times when that will be difficult and the sound quality apparently is also better when I record it. So I first want to make some general introductory points. Uh, especially for those of you who may be new uh, to this channel or to us or this course. So, before I begin today's uh, actual content, the introductory points. The first thing is I will, inshallah, be trying my best to make some kind of PowerPoint. I won't be doing that today, but I would strongly recommend that you try to follow this series with some type of paper, pen, notebook, laptop, some means in which you can take notes. Second is inshallah starting from tomorrow, tomorrow's upload, uh, I will also try to post a description in the video content, uh, also give an email address where you can give feedback. I may not be able to engage extensively uh, with you over email on the content of the course, but if you ask a question that I think I can clarify and explain during the course and as part of the course, I will, inshallah, try my best to incorporate your question later in the series. Beyond that, that is it. There's not much more uh, administrative stuff I can tell you. For those who are new to us, uh, probably the best way for you to decide because there are, mashallah, many, many uh, different course offerings, programs, lectures, talks in this month of Ramadan. Uh, many of them will likely be better than me, uh, and so you may be better off elsewhere. But if you're curious about this topic, uh, but you have not heard us before, and you're not sure exactly how what our manner or style of presentation is, I would suggest that you go into the video section uh, of the YouTube channel and click on, I would say, click on the Gems of the Quran series from last year Ramadan, then you get an idea of how we conduct courses using PowerPoints. And you should also you could also connect, uh, click on and check out um, any one of the previous talks we gave. They used to give these fancy titles to them: uh, historical, intellectual, spiritual study of Islam. There is, I think, a session there called Introduction to Islamic Theology. That would probably be the best one to check out. All right. Okay, so that is our welcome to new uh, friends. Uh, I would ask you, and, and those of you who know me, I've never ever asked this uh, because I find it very strange. Uh, but because of the particular way we're going to be doing it in this year's Ramadan, when we are also, uh, you know, all living it in our own, with our family together with four children at home, so it's difficult for me personally also sometimes to teach you live or in a recorded manner. So it would be good if at least for this month, for this course, you can subscribe uh, and whatever request to be notified. Uh, you're welcome to unsubscribe after the month ended. And Alhamdulillah, thus far in our life, we have no ads and no monetization or any of these other things. And inshallah, may Allah Ta'ala accept it from us. We have no intention to do so in the future. But simply for your own uh, ease, all right? Uh, that may be something you want to do because most likely uh, this year in Ramadan, unlike last year where everything was done live, I will have to do a mix of recording slash uploads and live classes. All right. So that concludes any administrative information any one of you listeners uh, may need. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, in Ahmadahu, when a stain of who, when a stock for who, when Ukminu be he, when a tobacco alay. When I would be lahi min shuruti an fusina, women say at a malina. May ya the hilla who fella, mudilla lava, may you lil who fella hadiella. When I should one la illa ha illa law who wahdu hula shedi kala. When I should anna say the na was senadina was shifi, and a Mohammedan abdu who were a sulu. 
amma ba. Faudhi billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhaladina amanu aminu billahi wa rasuli. Sadak Allahul Azim. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik wa ham ala abdika wa rasulik Sayyidina Muhammadin Nabi al-Ummi'i Kama sallayta wa barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid Alhamdulillah this is the first fast at least for us and for some of you when you listen May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq in this month of Ramadan to make the most of this month I try my best first and foremost for my own sake and also for our friends in the Ummah to try to do some type of dawah series, some type of course, lecture series in the month of Ramadan. This year I've decided to speak, uh, and this title is a bit complicated, and that's the first thing I want to explain to you, determining our core creed and beliefs. Actually, what I really fundamentally want to talk about in this series, uh, and this is now the proper introductory talk to the series, is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, so the first and foremost attribute of our Iman, um, you know, aspects of our Iman, Hakika, the reality of our Iman, is our Iman Billah, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Jalla Jalala, our Iman in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And I find this especially relevant in this time when I've come across and encountered many Muslims who, although outwardly and apparently make appear that they are confused about other things, about things in society or about law or about theology or about philosophy. In reality, it's actually, for many of them, in many cases, it's just revealing or indicative of an actual confusion they have about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many different ways to do this. Like last year, I will be leaning on Imam al-Ghazali ta'ala, and his works, but I do plan to mix it up. Uh, and personally, I feel uh, that the more we diversify our sources, I want to do verses of Quran with you. I will do some ahadith with you. Inshallah, I plan to do some du'as with you. I do plan to teach portions, summarize teachings, not line by line. But I do plan to summarize portions of some of the works of Imam al-Ghazali, ta'ala, all with this aim and goal uh, to try to understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better. So the first comment I want to say about that is that what does it mean to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? To what extent can we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is that knowledge only and only to be found in the Qur'an al Kareem? Is that knowledge only to be found in the Qur'an and the Sunnah? Is there any sense where that knowledge is personal, emotional, subjective? Is it possible that I, in certain ways, might know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense of I might conceive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or feel for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or indeed imagine some aspect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such as His mercy in a way that is different from my fellow believer whether in contemporary times or in the historical past or in the future. Or is there some single monolithic monotone monochrome way to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some other questions that we want to look at is what is the means through which I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do I know Him through my mind? Do I know Him through my heart? Do I know Him through my soul? And if we look at the Arabic equivalents of this, do I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through my aql? Do I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through my ilm? Do I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through my, through, through my iman? So I'm adding things. Do I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through my qalb? Do I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through my ruh? And the answer, as many of you can inshallah hopefully imagine, is all of the above, but it behooves us to think what, which aspect we need to work more on, where are we lacking. Third, whenever you talk about knowledge, you want to talk about two more things. So the first, 3A, ignorance. Where are those areas? I myself feel that I am still ignorant about many things. I myself hope, inshallah, to learn many, many things in the course of this series and this month. And that's one of the main, main reasons why I'm offering this to all of you. Are there areas where we may be ignorant in our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? For example, are there, is there knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran that we only have partially, inadequately, indeed perhaps insufficiently? 
Is there knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hadith? Is there knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside my very own ruh and my qalb? Is there knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out there in his reflected in his physical creation in the world that I don't have adequately, I have insufficiently? Or perhaps even there is an entire absence of that type of knowledge. And this is related to then what's going to happen to me if I don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intimately, which is another Arabic word, ma'rifa. If I don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as intimately as He wishes me to be known, how does that reflect on my iman and my relationship to Him? What's the reason? Is it just because I'm lazy? Is it just because I'm busy? Am I not interested in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do I not find Him? Do I not understand the hayra or the wonder and majesty? Am I not in amazement and awe and intrigued to know more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then if I have this inadequate knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's going to happen to my mind and heart and soul? What if I overly know intimately aspects of the material world or aspects of pleasures or my nafs or many other things that may be detrimental and harmful to me spiritually? Is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in of itself alone and sufficient to counter all of these possible harms and detriments? So these are all the type of questions that we want to look at. 3b, which is actually very important, so I'll make it a separate number. 4 is there's definitely going to be an aspect and a way, many aspects in many ways, in many senses, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unknowable. And this is one of the one of the many things we will be sharing you with you from Imam Ghazali Rum Allah Ta'ala, but one of the most powerful and I think you know beautiful aspect of his teachings that personally impacted me was that he writes a lot about <coughs> knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then he mentions very powerfully and I feel very accurately that Ultimately knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, absolutely knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, perfectly knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not possible. So there's two aspects, if you will, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, two aspects, if you will, to God. All right. Now I was also, as an aside, uh, because on the one hand I did kind of want to make this series accessible to people who have recently come to Islam, people who are considering Islam, people who are curious about Islam. People who may even be learning or academically studying Islam and may not be curious about it in terms of their own personal faith, but are curious to hear how Muslims understand their own religion, perhaps in a different way than the way non-Muslims teach Islam in the university. So normally, for such people, it's much more easier if I say the word God. I suppose it's very difficult for me to say. I don't think there's anything wrong in it, and I do use it when I am sort of engaging in purely academic audiences, but maybe that's just the kind of personal history that I have. But when I talk a lot about Islam, uh, and, you know, in the month of Ramadan, so it, it's, it's, it, I'm very used to saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all the Muslim listeners, I think, can understand that if there are any new Muslim or open theists or uh, exploring humans, uh, it would probably resonate with you slightly more if I said God. So I'm going to leave this amount of the work to you. When I say Allah, I only mean, I mean nothing other than the one and only God who is believed in and worshipped by Jews, Christians, Muslims, and perhaps even, I would argue, because the, in the Qur'an, God himself expresses like this, an ordinary human being, and the, one of the examples God gives in the Qur'an, an ordinary human being, when they set forth on, let's say, an example, a boat, and their storms, and in their heart, when they're worried, they turn to a being, a power, a supreme being, supreme force, supreme power, that is God, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright? So whenever you hear me say Allah, it just you can automatically understand the word God in English. You will also notice that after I say Allah, I often say a, a quick phrase, such as subhanahu wa ta'ala, jalla jalala. So these are just phrases that when we take the name of God in the Islamic tradition, we are expressing some element of praise, 
of love, of glorification. And that is something that I'm actually going to talk about later, is what is our relationship with the names of God. Okay? So now, henceforth, I will revert to what is natural to me and will come to me more fluently. Uh, Allah. All right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowable and unknowable. And this is by his nature and his choice. So by his choice, he is knowable to an extent, and it's a very large extent, and that's what I'm saying we have not explored yet. Knowable to the very large extent that he has revealed himself and aspects about himself in the Quran, in Scripture, in Revelation, through the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, through the Sunnah and Hadith, and there's much to learn about to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he wishes to be known. All right. Then there is another type of knowledge in which, in that sense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unknowable. So listen to me carefully because I'm about to say something a little bit tricky a few minutes from now, which you'll understand if you listen very carefully. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in another sense unknowable. The most extreme sense of this, the most absolute sense of this, the most true and permanent sense of this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge of himself. All right? So there's no way any one of us, any one of us can know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he knows himself to be. All right. However, there is a sense, and this is what I'm going to say is a bit tricky, how you express this in language. There's a sense, there's a second type of unknowable. So that is not what is referred to as knowing God, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he knows himself to be. Not that. There's a second type of unknowable, which is things that I don't know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you're not specific to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows himself. But it's just part of the description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I don't know. This second type of unknowable, it's also good. So in the earlier part I mentioned that we want to learn and discover and know that unknowable. But it's also very good, and I think for many people very helpful, if there remains a sense of the unknowable. Now let me explain this. So another aspect that we believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is why often we say ta'ala, is that he is transcendent. That's a fancy English word. It simply means that he is above and beyond our comprehension. But that itself is a concept that we can understand. So what does this mean? All of us right now, if I was to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah, his mercy, we all have some understanding of that. We all have some understanding of his rahmah and mercy. But none of us can say we completely understand his mercy. None of us can say we know every single thing about his mercy. None of us can say that we know to whom he will choose to be merciful and to whom he will not choose to be merciful. These, but the fact, but the, we know all this. We know that we don't know these things. And that is also wonderful. And that is also a very important aspect of our iman. Because I don't know everything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah or mercy, I can imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy when I'm turning towards him in dua, in countless ways. There's no limit on the way I can imagine, conceive of, relate to, pray to, supplicate to, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because my knowledge is not limiting me because I know that there's so many things that are unknowable. And it's in this sense that I just said and some of you may at some point need to rewind and rehear what I said for the past few minutes. It's in this sense 
that it is actually beautiful to not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala absolutely entirely. It's in this sense that it is beautiful to not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala absolutely and entirely. Because it leaves a sense of yearning, a sense of imagination, a sense of conceiving. And the other major thing, which is a very major thing in the Islamic tradition, it also leads to submission and humility. And that is a different kind of way of turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when we submit to Him in all of our humility, and sometimes in that humble submission, you will give up everything you read, everything you studied, all of the analysis you did, all the words of Imam al-Ghazali, right? And you will just focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with an with a unfettered, unfiltered mind and heart. And in fact, some of the, the true salihin, muttaqeen, shari'i practice of tazkiyah, one meth way they used to conceive and imagine of doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa name is that you focus on his name, Ism Jalala Allah, in such a way that you actually forget everything else. Because you want to do what is sometimes called a dhikr mutlaq, dhikr mahz, like a pure, unadulterated, unfiltered, not conceived type of dhikr. But that's not the only way, because many a time you need to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether in dhikr or du'a, or understanding the Qur'an al-Kareem, let's say tafsir, or understanding hadith, or understanding the world, or understanding yourself, through his names, so such as al-Razaq, understanding the world in that way, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained it in that way in the Qur'an, that he is the provider of sustenance for everything in this world, Understanding yourself that you're Abdul Razak, hmm? that there should be certain feelings of submission and obedience and love that come in your heart generally, but also specifically because you now know that Allah SWT is Al Razak. So, if you've been listening thus far, you would have seen that even in just literally, I think, 15 to 20 minutes, right? We have talked a lot about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How much more helpful is it to have this discussion and to search for more knowledge and answers on this topic than it is to argue and debate about, you know, very minor issues or to try to label people as traditionalists and modernists and have these divisions and divides in the ummah. And as I mentioned in an earlier talk before Ramadan, this is something that I felt is one of the, especially for Muslims living in Anglophone speaking, you know, the Anglophone world, this is a great tragedy. Uh, that each one is trying to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God in terms of contemporary times, contemporary societies, instead of trying to understand contemporary times and contemporary societies, in terms of our knowledge of God. And I think one reason for that is actually very simple, that they don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deeply. They don't have the type of knowledge that I was sharing with you so far that we want to try to learn and discuss in this series. And they're not even aware of the unknowables. And that's why then there's a lack of humble submission. All right. Another thing that we'll be doing, inshallah, is I will be looking as simply as possible for the purpose of this series some things from the tradition of Ilmul Kalam, Ilmul Kalam, which is f again very simply Islamic theology, uh, whether that was of a philosophical kind, whether that was of a scriptural kind, uh, and I will try to focus more, particularly uh, because this is my own personal preference, uh, is to focus on those ulama who were deeply grounded in their scholarship was also deeply grounded in the Qur'an. So for example, Imam al-Maturidi, 
he also wrote a tafsir of Quran. Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi also wrote a tafsir of the Quran. Imam al-Ghazali and we covered this in last year's parts of this in last year's Ramadan series has written a work on the gems and jewels of the Quran. All right. And Imam Baqilani has written a work on I'jaz, on the wondrous and inimitable nature of the Qur'an. And all four of these names I just mentioned to you, and I didn't actually mention them to you in any particular order. I didn't mention them to you in chronological order either. Uh, are also had a lot of scholarship in Kalam, in Islamic theology, and in Qur'an and Tafsir. Uh, so I personally always begin my journey when I'm researching and trying to learn about these topics and search for more knowledge on these topics from these four thinkers. Because there are so many works by Imam al-Ghazali that are available in English translation, for the purpose of this series, this year in Ramadan, I will be focusing specifically when we look at issues in Islamic theology in the writings of Imam al-Ghazali and I will mention then as we go different translations and one reason I feel this is important is that because mashallah all of these different people who put so much effort into preparing those translations and then publishing those translations and they're printed and they're out there and number one you know so it's an incredible blessing that his work and his thought and his writings are accessible but still a lot of people aren't benefiting from it and one reason may be perhaps that there is no you know it's hard sometimes to understand things if you read them yourself right that is why we have institutions of learning that's why we have discussions that's why we have courses uh, and i think that uh, it would be a tragedy that if uh, one group of people put so much effort in translating Imam al-Ghazali's works, and then there should be a much even greater effort in trying to teach his works, and a very small step in that direction is what we hope to do uh, in this series, inshallah. All right. So we are now halfway through. I will be trying uh, to keep the session shorter uh, this year round uh, from approximately one uh, to one and a half hours. So I want to now read out a, a small passage from the opening of Imam al -Husu. These are known as the Muqaddimah, sometimes the Khutbah of these works. So the opening preface, if you will, by Imam al ta'ala to his work on the names of Allah SWT, known in Arabic as al maqsada Asna fi Sharhi Asma'illahi Husna, the sort of, you know, the noble and exalted aims in the explication and commentary on the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the beautiful names of God. And one of the things he writes here, so, and I'm going to do everything in English, uh, is that he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so praise be to God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he continues after a few lines, and he, and he describes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a particular way, who makes the way of knowing him pass through the inability to know him. Allahu Akbar. So he's praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that being who makes the way, who makes the way of knowing him pass through the inability to know him. Now what does that mean, right? This sentence can mean many things. So part of it is something that I already tried to capture. What's going to happen is that every aspect of knowledge that we seek and inshallah try to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have two elements to it. One is realization. So realization, and it's slightly fancy, it just means that realization, awareness, understanding, comprehension of that knowledge. And immediately along with that, will be that aspect what I was mentioning as the unknowable aspect immediately. Not, it's not that, that there are other things that we still need to know. It's that this aspect itself that I know at one level, on another level, I don't know it. And when I go through this process of learning, this is what I will keep realizing. 
that on the one hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed humanity with an ability to know Him, and Allah ta'ala has revealed knowledge about Himself, and it is the duty and sincerity of humanity to exercise all of their ability to learn the entirety of that knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed about Himself, but at every single step of the way, every micro step of the way, at every station and every stage, at every piece and atom and iota of knowledge, humanity will also feel this reality that they're unable to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and indeed even what they have just learned and what they now know at many levels they will be unable to even know what they know. And that, that itself, by the way, is a sign that you are succeeding in this quest to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That every bit of knowledge, so go back to an example I gave you. So let's say somebody learned today for the first time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. As you go, you will keep learning more about His rahmah and everything you will learn, you will realize that I can never truly know this. So, you know, it, it's like, uh, it's almost like a difficult class, all right? So like when I took sarf the first time, I could not understand a single thing. Uh, well, I wouldn't say the first time, because the first time was very limited. The second time I took sarf, I took it. So sarf is this uh, fancy word they have for Arabic, simple English, Arabic verbal conjugation, and fancy word is Arabic morphology and syntax. Uh, the second teacher I studied with was so advanced himself in his knowledge and also in his method of learning, I absolutely didn't understand a single thing, right? But I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, and that led me to study it through third, fourth, fifth, and if I remember correctly, fifth or sixth times in my life. And alhamdulillah, I had the ability to teach it a couple of times also, which is actually I would count that as the sixth and seventh time that I learned it. So in the modern university, some people feel that way about inorganic chemistry or object-oriented programming or, you know, postmodernism, uh, things like that, right? But those are obviously not knowledges that are like the one we are talking about that you would want to learn over and over and over again. So I repeat again, what did Imam al-Ghazali Ramatala say? Now, I'm not sure, I can't say, but I'm going to assume that Imam Ghazali wrote these prefaces after he wrote the book, or he certainly, perhaps, I should not say certainly, he perhaps rewrote them after he wrote the book, or he was so brilliant that actually the whole roadmap of his work was already in his mind when he picked up the pen, and since he knew what he was going to write, which is quite, which is quite possible, at the very beginning he wrote a preface, giving you really the hasil the lub, right? The the ultimate, you know, attained knowledge, the nukta, right there in the front. It's in the first paragraph. And he and and it, and he shows practically by Amalan. What do we do? We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hamd. This is another way of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all hamd is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who revealed himself, who revealed knowledge about himself to us. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who made a way of knowing him by giving us an aql, a kalb, a ruh, wahi, Quran, kitab, sunnah, rasul, nubuwa, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then so much, a huge tradition of ilm, scholastic knowledge of the ulama and all of these things. Through the inability to know him. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who put that inability in us so that we could realize humility and submission. Then the second next thing he writes, immediately after this, again, praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who makes the tongues of the eloquent fall short of praising the beauty of his presence unless they use the means by which he praises himself and use his names and his attributes which he himself has enumerated, which means he has mentioned, right? 
So what does it mean? It means that the language of the Qur'an al-Karim is our ultimate language. In more fancy terms, the reference of the Qur'an al-Karim will be our ultimate reference. How we conceive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must always be grounded in the Qur'anic concept of God. And that is another mistake I see so many people making that they start making arguments in Islam, about Islam, about Islamic teachings, that if their arguments were true, then they would be actually negating or going against the Qur'an and God concept. How could a being of perfect mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of perfect knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of perfect wisdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all right, of perfect beauty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of perfect justice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in some way be held, now they allowed to blame for evil in this world, right? Yes, if you don't have that understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the only understanding is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-powerful, and therefore I don't understand why bad things happen in this world, it's just because you don't have the complete knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right. Now I would also say, uh, now I won't read it, but I'm going to summarize and, and kind of adapt something that Imam Ghazali Ramatullah wrote. For some people, I would say for everyone, uh, actually for everyone, too much knowledge can actually not be a good thing. So just like we have a concept of overdosing, right? So the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Qur'an al-Kareem, Kulu wa wa that you should eat and drink, but do not overindulge and go into excess. So that's actually another way to think about the unknowable aspect of God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes you have to let yourself fall short of complete realization and knowledge. Sometimes you have to curtail yourself. And that's an individual uh, decision, an individual matter that each individual can feel out best for themselves. Certainly if there is some friend, colleague, teacher, mentor who knows you very well, they may be able to offer you some advice uh, as to how deep you should go. And again, if we look at Imam Ghazai Rumatala's life, uh, you know, there are many stages in his life. And it's interesting because, you know, people in the academic university understand him differently in some ways uh, than Muslims do. And so I want to present an understanding of Imam Ghazali, Rima Ta'ala, actually his life. And I may spend the next, you know, part of today's session just doing that. Imam Ghazali, Rima Ta'ala, first and foremost, like each and every one of us, you and me, is simply a human being. All right? Therefore, he's not the perfect being. Allah SWT is the perfect being. And as every one of us, you and me, in addition to being, being a human being, he was living in a human society, in human surroundings, which are also inevitably going to be flawed. So sometimes there's a lot of you know, emphasis on certain political circumstances during his life. And, you know, not to deny any of that, and again, for the purpose of this series, I'm keeping things very simple, but the reality is, is that no matter how you try to contextualize his life in terms of the politics and society of that time, you cannot escape the fact that he definitely went on a journey, and he definitely acquired something in that journey, and he returned after that journey to share what he acquired with the Ummah. And I think he himself would never have imagined that the books he was writing at that time would be translated 900 years after he passed away and would actually be studied and taught at the leading educational institutions, not tragically of the Muslim world, but at the leading educational institutions of the non-Muslim world, and actually, and I've witnessed this twice now in my life, Ivy League and Oxbridge professors moved to tears by Imam Ghazali. Not, te- well, single, small, one or two tears, but tears nonetheless, right? 
I don't think he would have ever in the farthest ranges of an imagina- his imagination ever thought that that would be the case. So clearly, there is something about his life that is interesting. Yes, you know, when he wrote his al Munkir Min Al-Dalal, uh, which is famously translated as Deliverance from Error, although, you know, some people like to translate it a bit more precisely, but Deliverance from Error is such a wide spread translation. So yes, he's telling you parts of his life. He's not telling you his whole life. And as a historian, you may be able to dig up other things and you may try to analyze other things. But the reality is that the parts that he is sharing with us in that work of his are also definitely parts of his life, even though it may not be it may not be the entirety of his life. And that's fair enough. He's a human being and he's free to share whatever aspect of his life with us that he wants. So what does he share? And I want to try to extract the most general lessons we can from that life story of Imam Ghazali Ramadan that was shared by Imam Ghazali. So if you will, to know Imam Ghazali the way he wishes to be known, that is also a product, right? Given that he wrote his own partial spiritual, partial autobiography. All right. So he was seeking, right? And ultimately, really what he was seeking, the word he uses in Arabic is yaqeen, a sense of certainty and conviction and knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some of you who are listening may not be such seekers right now. Some of you, mashallah, may actually be very, very religious people. Uh, some of you could even just fall short and pull out right now uh, of the course. No, inshallah, there's nothing I will say that will be in any way, inshallah, al-aman al-hafiz, confusing in any way. But like I said, there is some bliss, like they say, ignorance is bliss. There is a certain bliss and contentment if you are at a state or stage in your heart and your life where you can comfortably think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and feel that feeling of yaqeen. What's interesting about Imam Ghazali Rumah ta'ala is despite having more knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah that I think that any one of you and us, you and me, uh, will ever have, right? Despite having all that knowledge, notwithstanding all that knowledge, he didn't feel that he had yaqeen. That itself, I, and I think this is why this is a theme that keeps coming across as I've shared with you. This notion is the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So this is what I'm saying, that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. You have to learn to un- handle this feeling of not knowing, Right? And if you don't think you can handle the feeling of not knowing, maybe you don't want to know more because the more you know, the more you will not know. So anyway, if hopefully you understood, right? All right. So Imam Ghazai Rumulata, looking for Yaqeen. So it's not exactly the way he describes it, but he describes it like this, which is a very, you know, popular form of style stylistic form of writing that you make divisions and classes very much you know in the literature that predated Imam al Taala. so he makes division of these different categories of seekers the Sufis which are very different if you say the English word Sufi today you're really going to immediately conjure up an idea uh, an image and be referring to people who are totally unlike what Imam al Taala meant Right, so I will use a different word in Arabic, the mutasawwif, the mutasawwifun. Right, the mutasawwifun. Let's say the people of spiritual endowment. All right. Second, he looks at the philosophers, which is again a very particular kind of philosophy and philosopher at that time. Third, he also looked at theologians. Right, ilm al kalam, people who were using their ilm, their knowledge, their scholastics. Uh, and also a healthy amount of logic and reasoning to try to understand more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fourth, he actually referred to a very particular sub subsect of a subsect of the Shia sect, right? So they are called the Bataniya, people who believed entirely and exclusively in esotericism. But again, things are never that simple. So I will leave the Bataniya out uh, because that is actually not a subject of my own knowledge and study. When you're left with these three, uh, so you have the people of spiritual, 
seeking and insight, you have people of philosophy, and you have people of theology. All right. Now, when I wanted to take the more general lesson out, rather than looking at it for our purposes, the way he looked at it in terms of division of seekers, let's look at it in terms of ways of knowing, right? So how can I increase my knowledge of Allah SWT through spirituality, through worship, through dua? Yes, you can. And that doesn't necessarily require any type of formal tasawwuf or quote-unquote Sufism. Can I increase my knowledge about Allah SWT through ilmul kalam, through learning more, reading commentaries on the Asma'al Husna, reading commentaries on uh, the verses in Quran where Allah Ta'ala talks about his intimate nearness, his qurb, his ma'iyya, his presence. Yes, you can. What about that other aspect of ilm al-kalam where they used reason and arguments and logic? Yes, those things can help you in the sense that they help you think more clearly. They help you structure your thoughts. They can sometimes help you go deeper in your knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it wasn't just the ulama of ilm al-kalam who did this. You will find much of fiqh is actually very structured, very logical. And in fact, many of the commentaries on hadith also sometimes go very deep. And definitely, many of the works of tafsir also a very regimented, structured way in which they try to go deeper and deeper in their investigation. So rather than specifically say ilm al-kalam or specifically the discipline of Islamic theology, I'm going to just suggest that knowledge. So for the first one, I will simply say spirituality. The second is knowledge. And then falsafa. So here I'm going to take this notion of philosophy and I'm going to put part of it, I don't know if it's half of it, I'm going to put some of it under knowledge, which I've already mentioned, right? So thinking about things, using your reason, using your mind, wondering, trying out ideas, articulating them, right? Uh, that is all beneficial. So all of those aspects of philosophical thinking, I'm going to lump under knowledge. There's one aspect, one kind rather, I would say, of philosophizing that I'm going to separate out. And that, those of you who know about Imam al-Ghazali, that was also one of the major things uh, that he did in his life was to try to separate out what sometimes people refer to as the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and he actually, after his extensive study, and it was specifically really Ibn Sina's philosophy, which itself had elements of Plato, Aristotle, Plotinus, Neoplatonism, etc., etc. Don't worry about any of that for now, for this series. All right? But basically, this is what Imam al was looking at, and he wasn't looking at their philosophy about math or about you know biology or chemistry. He was looking at their philosophical and their philosophy as it pertained to understandings about God and religion, about Allah Subhanahu wa and Deen. And within that, he said, "Okay, look, there's only twenty things that I found that are issues. Of them, there are only three that actually go against the teachings of Islam, and seventeen uh, are not outright." outrightly against Islam, but they are problematic. All right? Okay, and again here I'm using the most simple terms to discuss, to describe this phenomenon. So that type of, now, for us in this day and age, what does that mean? So that type of philosophizing, that type of thinking, that type of knowing, that does not start with revelation and prophecy at its core. That is unlikely to bring you to the best type of knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you could have. All right? No doubt all of us carry all types of knowledge in our minds and brains. Uh, I've gone through different forms of education and schooling. Uh, and that is, you know, for many, for everyone, it's part of who they are and their identity. But to actively, consciously try to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on terms other than he himself has revealed in revelation either through Quran, Karim, Scripture, Kitab or through Nubuwa, Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam, is not a project that's going to be very successful. All right? So that aspect of philosophy. Now sometimes, yes, you can learn things about yourself when you learn about the other. Right? Uh, for example, there are some Muslim writers who have commented on this, that they had their own robust understanding of the oneness, right? The wahdaniyyah, 
Wahidiya, Ahadiya, the oneness, unicity, uniqueness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they encountered, let's say in medieval times, early medieval times, Christian theologians who talked about the Trinity, that actually made them, the Muslim, the Islamic theologians, even more deeply understand why this teaching uh, is so critical in the Quran about the oneness and unicity and wahdaniya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they actually appreciated that even more in a, in a new way, in an additional way, where they encountered some other, right? So that element can also be there. And you will see a little bit of that, uh, probably not in this series that we will do in Ramadan, but you can find senses of that in Imam Ghazal, Ta'ala. You can find senses of that again in works of tafsir, right, as well. Okay. So, when we go back to Imam Ghazali Ramatala's life, now that I've explained this, it's the lessons that we, I feel you and I can draw, generally, but also for the purpose of our series. It's good to be on a journey. It's good to be a seeker. And if you think about this, this whole notion of Sirat al-Mustaqim, it's a path. And we are travelers on the path, we are seekers on the path, and this is known as Talab. Dada means to have a desire. And so that's the very first thing that we need to ignite in our heart is a desire to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He wishes to be known. A desire to have the maximal, means the maximum amount of that knowledge that I could have. Why? Because this is about our iman. Why? This is actually our greatest reality as a human being. What greater value could a human being have other than, greater than the value in that human being knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their Rabb, their Lord, the God that created them. This is the greatest attainment of a human being's life in terms of knowledge, in terms of learning, all right? In terms of their own realization, in terms of their own identity. And I think that is something that Imam al-Ghazal realized when I look at his life because otherwise if you look at it, he had everything. He had a fully endowed permanent professorship at the you know the most famous Islamic institution in Baghdad. He had students, admirers flocking from across the Muslim world. He had proficient in Arabic and Quran and Tafsir and Fiqh and Usul, right? Was sufficiently well off materialistically, financially, right? He had everything that you would imagine. Outwardly it appeared deen and dunya, right? What people say, he had everything. The perfect balance. He dedicated his life day and night to teaching and writing Islam. So he had that life of service to deen. So the fact that somebody walked away from all of that, which again I think is greater than you and I will ever even have, means that what they walk towards must be of immense importance and value. And that's what we and you, inshallah, we're going to try to do in this series, is we want to walk towards that also. Well, khair, Imam al relatively speaking, we're going to crawl towards that, right? Uh, and Imam al mashallah, you know, Allah Ta'ala put so much power and barakah and I feel kubuliya means Allah Ta'ala put so much blessing and acceptance in his journey. Imam al wa Ta'ala made leaps and bounds and that we can benefit from and sometimes take guidance from. And, and so to speak, as I once sometimes said, to put our footprints in the footsteps of others. And that's the concept of Sirat al-Mustaqeem. Sirat al-Ladheena namta alayhim. This is the path of people who Allah Ta'ala, you have blessed them. So it's about them and it's about you and it's about you and them and then it's going to be about me. So me, Ansarat al-Mustaqeem, is going to involve them because you are involved in them. You bless them, right? And so I need to put my footsteps in their footprints. And there'll be a little bit of that that we're basically doing here with Imam Ghazairu Mulatala. And that's where I felt I wanted to begin in the first session is that he walked away and he walked toward. Now, me and you, we're not going to be able to walk away from our lives like that, right? And I'm not suggesting that either. But we, there are ways to walk toward that. 
without walking away from everything entirely. All right? Uh, and that is really creating a desire in your heart. When you have a desire to do something, there is no website that can entice you. There is no, you know, frivolous news item, infotainment that can attract you. There is no consumerism and marketing that can ensnare you because you have a talab in your heart. You have a desire in your heart. Look at the student during the exam week. Is there any pop-up ad that they click on? Is there any random surfing that they're doing? Are they reading every item in the news? Are they Googling and Wikipediaing and etc. etc.? Are they even replying to people's emails and WhatsApps? Are they even reading people's emails and WhatsApps? No, because there's a talab, so to speak. There's a desire. There's a pressing, urgent need and matter that they're attending to. Right? And so this is, alhamdulillah, Ramadan has already taken care of this for us. Right? This is why doing such courses in Ramadan, I've always found personally so helpful. The barakat of Ramadan, the barakah of fasting, uh, all these features, and we spoke about that in the earlier talk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated all of that. It's a wonderful month for learning, right? Learning with the niyyah and the aim and goal of spiritually transforming. The second thing that you see in Imam Ghazali Ramadan's life that can be a lesson for us, is you know because what he did in that immediate journey of his his sojourn for a couple two years uh, was very complicated right and i don't think we can replicate that in the course we could try to replicate that in ramadan in terms of worshiping more at night waking up earlier at the time of tahajjud making more dua making more dhikr and i so that's the second lesson i wanted to take from his life although he may have done it sequentially you and I can try to do it simultaneously. What is that? So the unknowable aspect that I mentioned, the submission and humility aspect that I mentioned, I would want it to be in such, I'm addressing myself, I would want it to be in such a way for myself that if I read a chapter of a book, Imam Ghazali, I need to also move forward in a chapter of my submission and humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to move forward in terms of a chapter, in terms of my dua and zikr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I need to move forward in my in a chapter in my love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no doubt, like I said, we can't imagine and capture that because obviously he didn't share so many things with us about what happened to him and what experiences he went through in those two years. But certainly we know a little bit more about his return uh, and his teaching and, and his life after that. Uh, and I think, again, this is the blessing. Because otherwise, if we were to teach this in university and during the semester outside Ramadan, there's no way we could do this other project simultaneously. And, you know, if any of you, you know, mashallah, may be very, very busy with many things, family obligations, children, parents, spouse, work, you know, even a little bit, even just add five minutes uh, to the schedule you had planned in Ramadan uh, that along... Uh, you know, and, and you know, honestly, if you're going to take an hour, an hour and a half a day to listen to this, uh, then it actually is critical that you also take 20, 30, etc. minutes to add on to your whatever existing ibadah you had planned and consider that really part of this course. And maybe we'll get lucky. You know, what does it mean, luck? Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send his fadl and karam on one of you or me or all of us inshallah and actually enable us to pull this simultaneous thing off and other to experience that submission and humility and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that accompanies this journey and quest to learn more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the third lesson from his life I would say you and I well, I will have to do it, but you, I would suggest, you're fortunate, you don't have to do this at least this month. The third lesson in his life was that when he returned, he, quote-unquote, put pen to paper, he tried to express these things. So in Arabic, this is called ta'bir. And he did it for the sake of the ummah. And inshallah, mean you're going to benefit from that in that very pure and noble and sincere intention of his. But I would suggest, and I'm going to have to express so I will, because I will be speaking, but I would suggest to all of you, and in this sense I have hasra, so the English word is an envy, but I, um, 
what would be the appropriate English word? I wish greatly that were I in your shoes, that I could learn without giving ta'bir, without giving expression. So let, let things remain abstract. What happens is that sometimes when we make our mind, and we're going to talk about the interplay between these things, when we make our mind do too much work, then our heart just becomes quiet, right? Almost like a shy child who doesn't speak because there's so many active and dynamic other children in the classroom, right? And so obviously Imam Ghazali spent his two years in silence and contemplation and worship and reflection and he emerged from that and then he expressed all these amazing things in his writings, right? Uh, so I would say that let these things linger, let yourself contemplate and reflect over them and use anything you learn and increase in your knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala insha'Allah during this series, in your du'as in Ramadan, in improving your understanding of Qur'an al when you recite it, alright? But don't necessarily try to express it in language or writing or teaching. Uh, these things take time. The English word they, you know, we use for this is curating. You must curate these feelings. You must tend to them. You must nurture them, right? Before you try, to, to, lest you prematurely try to harvest them. All right. So this was the introduction that I wanted to give you, uh, and inshallah, you have an idea of some of the topics that we want to cover. Uh, we make du'a that Allah spanta because there's so many things actually. Once one gets started, that may Allah enable us to select the things that are of most benefit to all of us. Uh, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put barakah in all of our time, in our learning, in our practice of deen. Wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanallah bin ala wahab, subhanallah wa alhamdulillah wa la ilaha illa Allah wa Allah wa akbar. Allahumma salli wa salli wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Sayyid wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Kama sallaita wa barakta ala Ibrahima wa ala ala Ibrahima inna ka hamidu majid. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you accept this series from us. We ask that you enable each and every one of us, whether we listen now or listen later or listen in any time in our lives, to learn that knowledge that will bring us closer to you, that will bring us closer to the true knowledge of you. And in Bikram, we wish to know you, to love you, we wish to know you, to submit to you, we wish to know you, to fear you, we wish to know you, to obey you, we wish to know you, to worship you. Yet in Bikram, we have allowed so many harmful and so many futile bodies and repositories of knowledge to enter our mind and brain. Ya Allah, we ask that you purge us from that, cleanse us of that, fill our hearts and our minds with knowledge of you, knowledge of Qur'an al-Kareem, knowledge of your kalam, knowledge of your kitab, knowledge of Rasuluk, knowledge of your Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, knowledge of the sunnah that you inspired him to teach and live, knowledge of your beloved Muttaqeen, Salihin, Sahaba, Kiram, and his companions, radiallahu ta'ala, anhum ajma'in. Ya Allah, we ask that you give us the true knowledge of the heart that you have given us. Grant us the true knowledge of the ruh that you have given us. Grant us true knowledge of the aql, the mind that you have given us. And let us use each and every aspect of our being, the very core and essence of our being, to turn to you, to long for you, to pray to you, to worship you, to obey you. Ya Rabbi Kareem, fill our hearts with all of the feelings of Qur'an, with all the feelings of the sunnah. Ya Rabbi, we can only imagine Sahaba Kiram, when Nabi Kareem, Sunnah, first taught them something about you or when you Ya Allah first revealed an aspect of yourself in the Quran to them the first time they heard that you are Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim what feelings they must have had in their heart Ya Allah we ask that you fill our heart with those same feelings we want to feel the feelings of joy and wonder they felt on discovering and learning about you from the best of teachers your best of messengers Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ya Allah grant us the lazat of Iman the newfound wonder and taste of Iman grant us Ya Rabb the joys and thrills of Iman Ya Rabb grant 
grant us yaqeen and absolute certainty of faith and conviction in our iman. Ya Allah, take us out from all of the unlawful desires, unlawful inclinations, all of the unlawful temptations. And Ya Rabbi Kareem, fill our heart with the talab and a desire for you, a desire to please you, to be pleasing to you, to learn what forms your pleasure. Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you accept our fasts in this month of Ramadan, accept our worship in the month of Ramadan, make this Start of Ramadan, Ya Rabbi Kareem, the start of a change in our life, a transformation in our life. And first and foremost, Ya Rabb, we ask that you make us your true Ibad, Ibadak al Salihin, Ibadak al Muttaqeen, Ibadak al Mu'mineen, Ya Allah Rabbi Kareem. And Ya Allah, we make dua for the Ummah, especially the oppressed of this Ummah. Seeking knowledge is a luxury, Ya Allah. We do shukr to you and are grateful to you that you granted us the ease in our life to take out this time. Ya Allah, we make Dua for all of those who don't have such ease, who are in every hardship, in difficulty, in dire circumstances, faced with adversity, injustice, and oppression. Ya Allah, we ask that you send your special rahmah and mercy on them, your fadl and karam on them. Protect them, Ya Allah, from every evil. Rescue them from every evil. Fill their heart with solace and sukoon. Fill their hearts with comfort, Ya Rab. Ya Rabbi Kareem, we ask that you shower the most choice and special of your barakat in Ramadan on the Muslimin and the oppressed and the poor and the needy and the distressed of the Ummah. Ya Allah Rabbi Kareem Rabbana takambal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tubu alayna inna ka anta tawab rahim wa sallallahu ta'ala ala habibihi Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin Amen